Good morning or good afternoon or even a uh, good evening to folks as you are joining us. Um, thank you for tuning in. Today we'll be talking about uh, Women in Housing Networks Connection. It will be around assignments and occupancy management. And so I'm excited to spend some time with folks today. Before, uh, we have a great uh, panel today. I'm excited to toss it over to them. But before we get started and we'll introduce these folks, um, I wanna give a couple of updates. First, starting with the Akua Y Stories. It's um, a podcast that is now available. I think this past week, they just... Um, did like maybe the second or third episode around Rebecca O'Hare. It was a really great um, episode. And so encouraging folks to, uh, it, you can stream it on any platform and listen maybe on your Saturday morning walk or if you're doing laundry or cleaning or reading or getting stuff done around the house. Um, some other things we want to let you know is about our virtual offerings happening in April from Akua Y. Uh, one of them is actually happening right now with the Small College University and Symposium. So that is an option available to folks. And also the Live In Symposium is next week. So we hope that folks uh, will join us. If you're interested and you want to learn a, a little bit more information, uh, feel free to log on to akuawai.org. Um, and then the last piece is around our online resources. There's a wealth of knowledge that's there. You can chat on the community boards. There's information. You can post questions and even look up stuff. So feel free to utilize that as you are engaging and wanting to learn more from um, other folks in the field. Some notes about today's session is that this is a conversation. It's not a traditional webinar. And so we want to give you the opportunity to connect and be a part of this session. So if possible, if you could please have your webcam on to help us engage with one another, that would be great. And also we'll be monitoring the um, questions and comments. And so you can use the chat feature to drop a nugget in there um, and our moderator will be able to take them. So I'm now going to toss over the virtual mic to Sierra Davis, our subcommittee chair for our membership development network for women in housing. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. I'm very excited to have you here today. Um, but my name is Sierra Davis. I'm a residential life coordinator at the University of Houston, Theory. Um, so I'm really excited to be here today and be the moderator for today's event. Um, for our Women in Housing Assignments and Occupancy Management Roundtable. Um, so before we get started, just in case this is your first time joining us, um, just so you're aware, the vision of the AQI Women in Housing Committee is to serve as a primary knowledge resource regarding the issues and needs of women's professionals within the field of campus housing. Um, and then more specifically, the Membership Development Subcommittee that I chair now, um, is to help fulfill women in housing's vision through the following strategies, which is seeking and creating content and recruiting women to sustain quality roundtables, such as this one you're about to experience, um, gathering and sharing resources to collectively build a regional toolkit for all nine of Google regions to freely access and utilize. And lastly, um, recruiting mentors and mentees to sustain a vibrant mentor match program alongside other committees and subcommittees within ACUA. So um, before we get started, the panelists for today's roundtable um, for the women in assignments and occupancy management, we have three panelists joining us today. Um, we have Michelle Soika, um, the Assistant Director of Operations for Resident Education and Development at the University of Cincinnati. I'm a Reds fan, so that's exciting. <laughs> Um, then we also have Catherine Magura Krieger, Assistant Director of Operations at Oregon State University. And then we also have Kristen Shore, Associate Director of Housing and Residence Life at Lynn University. So again, thank you all for being here. Thank you to our panelists. I um, really appreciate it. We're going to spend about 45 minutes or so um, listening to the panelists, having some conversation about different areas. And then we'll also lose some additional time at the end in case y'all have questions um, or anything you'd like them to expand on and things like that. So to get us started with our first question, um, panelists, if you could please spend a few minutes sharing with us your journey towards becoming an assignments and occupancy management professional. 
Yeah, so I'll go ahead and get us started. Um, thank you, Sierra. My, my name again is Christy Shore. Um, I'm an Associate Director of Housing and Residence Life at Lane University, which is a small private school located in Boca Raton, Florida. Um, truth be told, I started on the residential education side. Um, I supervised RAs, I supervised grad students, professional staff, I built residential curriculum, um, all those different pieces, programming and so on and so forth. Um, but the trend I noticed for myself is, is I was always trying to build process within residential education. Um, I was always trying to be like, how can I make this the most effective programming proposal form? Or how could I just make things more efficient? Um, and I noticed for myself that that's something that really filled my cup, that I loved working with students as well, but I loved that opportunity to really build um, process within residential education. Um, and my peers could see that as well, because I feel like they sometimes got sick of me when I talked about like, we, we, we can make it this way <laughs> in this process. Um, and so I just started asking questions. Um, our assignments team at my last school was always open to us asking those questions and, you know, talking about assignments and occupancy um, and asking, you know, how does this work and how does that work? Um, at my last institution, we used STARES specifically. And I feel like I had to ask the same question a few times because at times STARES can be a little intense. And, but, but then it just in, intrigued me and it got me excited. Um, and I was given the opportunity to um, transition um, schools and trans go home because I got to move home with this role that I'm in now. Um, and I took that opportunity and I was able to get involved um, directly in the occupancy management side and build um, an online management for, um, program for this institution that I'm at. And so that's really how I got in is I noticed my own strengths within my role. Um, and then I took the opportunity to ask questions um, and then seeked out those opportunities in order to get the role I'm in today. Uh, my role is a little different than the normal role, I would say. Um, I also oversee all conflict and mediation for my university. Um, so what I really appreciate about my role now is I get to fill that cup of process, but I also get to fill in that cup of that student interaction still. Um, so I kind of get the best of both worlds of being um, still involved with students directly, um, while also, you know, being involved um, in the housing occupancy management world um, that I live in. Um, sometimes I call myself the office of, if you come to my office, you're probably not happy about something. Um, you're either happy, not happy about your room, um, or you're in a, don't like your roommate or something and, and that's okay because I always say at the end of the day the goal of you to leave my office is on a positive note or in a better stance than we were before. Um, so I'm grateful that I still get to do occupancy while still having that student touch. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle Soika. I am, uh, as mentioned by Sierra, I'm Assistant Director of Operations for Res Education and Development at the University of Cincinnati. Probably the longest title I've ever had in my career. Um, I uh, am in a unique sort of situation because we're a bifurcated system at the University of Cincinnati. And so I do operations work in residence life, um, which was a newly created position four years ago. Um, ironically, I think is that I'm transitioning to housing in two weeks. So um, there's some irony in sharing that in this moment, but um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But um, I had a very traditional path as well. So I've been at UC for seven and a half years. Um, I started at uh, Eastern Illinois University, served as an RA, came up in a very traditional path, Western Illinois for my graduate work as a, and a graduate hall director, spent some time uh, in Michigan at Ferris State University, one of my coldest locations ever, um, record amounts of snow that year, of course, so um, the, the year that I started there. So um, I have a different love for Michigan, Michiganders uh, with snow. Um, I went back to my alma mater, Eastern, and served as a complex director for five and a half years before um, heading to University of South Florida and serving as an assistant director. Paige just was like, I didn't know that. Uh, you could see that look. Um, and so then I wound up back in the Midwest at University of Cincinnati. And I would say that all of those positions leading up to four years ago were very heavy in a residence life. Um, 
background and um, and focus. And so um, I'll be honest, when I was at Ferris State as a first year hall director, and they were like, you're doing occupancy reports every Monday, you have to send it. And I was like, Ugh. and I was like the hall director who sent them in after they were due and all the things. And so um, I struggled through that a lot as, an, as a young professional. Um, and then when I got to Cincinnati, um, the housing side of our partnership um, created a scholarship is what it was called for attending business operations conference. And so before I was even in the role that I'm currently in, I had an opportunity to go to BizOps. Um, I think it was 2015. I was actually texting with a friend about that earlier. Um, and so I got to attend that and I was like, oh, maybe I do like some of this. I can dabble in a little bit more. And then my current department restructured and created this assistant director of operations to focus more on the operational needs, hall opening and closing, um, logistics, uh, break housing, and then supervising our full-time staff members who oversee our 24-hour desk operations in um, our halls. And, and we have neighborhoods. Um, I call the staff I supervise neighborhood operations managers. That is not their University of Cincinnati title. What their title is makes zero sense. So we don't refer to them <laughs> by their HR title. Um, so through that, my role with occupancy management has significantly increased because it is my team members who are doing room changes. So we don't do the initial assignments, but we do the room changes. We do the emergency room moves. Um, we have to uh, report all of the census data at the end of every, or sorry, at the start of every semester. So um, while we may not do the exact assignments, we are responsible for 10 to 13 weeks of the semester, really managing the occupants of our building. And um, as fortunate as I have been to be able to also do their job due to vacancies, I have learned a lot about occupancy, occupancy management and, um, and their role, which has helped me help them throughout, throughout the process. The other key piece to it is um, I'm also responsible for quarantine and isolation housing on our campus and through that have done a lot with um, assignments, occupancy management, um, and learning a lot about predicting demand for Q&I housing when we had certain types uh, times of the year uh, when our like football team, oh maybe this one shouldn't be shared, but like our football team was probably going to take up a majority of our uh, rooms at one point in the academic year or when we did a no before you go event um, and having to learn on the fly um, how to figure out those numbers and report them all the way up through um, second in command at the university. So that's me. Thanks, everyone. And hi, everyone. My name is Catherine Magura Krieger, and I'm the Assistant Director for Operations at Oregon State University. Um, I'm going to be the one who didn't come up through that traditional route. Uh, the closest I got to being in anything res life capacity was being on Hall Council my freshman year of college. Um, and while I have utmost respect for my colleagues who manage our residence halls, uh, I knew pretty quickly that um, while I probably could have been a good RA because I'm good at holding people accountable, it wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, when I was in my undergrad, I actually did my undergrad at Oregon State University as well. Uh, I worked in what we call a service center. So we've got essentially three areas on campus that has a central uh, dining center in that central place. That's where we manage all the mail and keys for all the residents as well. And so I worked in one of those. And then the summer between my junior and senior year of college, I got to work in our assignments office and help with this, the room assignments for the fall students. And I loved it. Um, I was working on a degree in psychology at the time and found that I was using a lot of the skills that I was learning um, in that job. And as I'm hearing from students calling with roommate conflicts, I'm like, oh, I learned about something like this in my psych classes. And so I was just really enjoying that process. And I've always had a, a strong commitment to a customer service philosophy and, and ethos and working with, um, well, really serving anyone. And so um, I got to work in that office during my senior year of college. And then as I was about to graduate with my degree in psychology, uh, not knowing what I was gonna do with my life, what was gonna be next for me, um, they were restructuring the housing office a bit on campus and were creating a brand new assignments coordinator role, which was a very entry level position. It was assignments coordinator slash office manager. Um, and so I'll put my name in the hat for that. And 
got that position. And here I am almost to the day, 20 years later, <laughs> having worked my way up through the ranks. Um, and so I started out as an assignments coordinator, uh, doing that in part um, office manager, and then uh, moved into um, more of a management position where I was supervising other people. And now as an assistant director, uh, I have three direct reports at this point in time, uh, two assignments coordinators, and then someone who runs those uh, service center desks as well. And so um, all of the housing assignments, technology, customer service, door access, all of that kind of stuff comes up through my wheelhouse. So um, for someone who took as little math as possible in college, um, I do a lot of math and occupancy statistics and reporting and pivot tables, all those kinds of things in my daily life. Um, since I didn't come up through the more traditional route, um, my path has been a bit different in terms of trying to figure out uh, what does it mean to be an occupancy management professional? You know, where do I fit in this big old sphere that is a Kuhawai? And I'll never forget, I went to my first conference a couple of years in. I went to Northwest Tukuho, the regional conference. And I came back from the conference and I was talking to my boss about it and he was asking me what I thought. And I was like, it's great if you supervise RAs and want to know about the wellness wheel or um, what does it mean to have work-life balance. But there wasn't anything in, in the conference that spoke to me. So I don't know, I'm going to do any more of these conference things. And my boss just kind of looked at me and he said, well, you, know, you know how to make a difference and how to make sure that your conference experience is something that's going to be relevant to you? I was like, no. And he's like, well, you, you present. It's like, oh. So that's where I started to find my voice in the organizations at that point. And then cut to, I don't know if it was the 2015 Business Operations Conference, Michelle, but there was one there where I might've had my hand in about five or six different sessions. Um, we're to the point where people are like, can you let someone else be on this panel, please? <laughs> so that's kind of how I've worked my, my way in. And I've, I've kind of um, developed a passion for creating a space within this organization for people who, do this type of work because it tends to be people who are more behind the scenes getting um, the different types of work done and aren't necessarily out in front getting all the accolades or opportunities. So, and Christy, your story was really exciting to me because you would be the resident director. I would kind of latch on to it's like this one, this one knows, this one wants to do this. I, all these questions about how occupancy management works, how much time do you have? Let's go grab coffee. <laughs> Thank you all for those introductions. Um, for our next question, what words of advice would you give to someone interested in transitioning into assignments and occupancy management um, from a different functional area? Um, yeah, so I would say for my advice, I consider myself that I'm someone that always wants to learn. I want to learn everything. I want to know all the things if I can, because if anything, it's, it's just adding to my toolkit. Um, and I think learning looks differently for everyone. Um, I do have two master's degrees. So I do have a master's in higher education and I have a second master's in business. Um, and I do find that that has helped me at times having that business background of thinking a little differently than the standard higher education way that I, I learned originally, I guess you could say. Um, but with that being said, I ask a lot of questions. And so that's what I continue to do is though I'm considered the expert, I would say more, more so here at my institution, um, I'm always asking questions. My supervisor and I, sometimes people listen to our conversations and, uh, and don't understand what we're saying, that it's like our language that we're saying when it comes to housing occupancy. I'm, and I have to tell the other person next to me, I'm like, let me explain what this really means. Uh, but that's what I would say is just to continue to ask questions. Um, I don't know any professional in housing anywhere that's going to tell you, no, I'm not going to explain this to you or no, I'm not going to tell you this. It's really on you if you want to create that time for yourself. Um, and then I also would say just continuing to connect within whether that's your state, your region in circumstances like this. Um, example, I've never navigated a public private partnership um, and we are building a public private partnership and what that looks like for our contracts and housing and leases. And they're talking about two contracts. And I don't even know if my system can do that and all these different pieces. Um, and so I'm meeting with um, seasoned, prof seasoned professionals um, more than me that have experienced those conversations already and have navigated those things. Um, and I am continuing to meet with a few different people because everybody's contract looks a little different. Um, so I would just say, continue to ask those questions and not be afraid to say, I don't know. Um, as much as I'm sitting here as a, a panelist, so to speak, I would say that I'm not nearly, you know, I always have room to learn. Um, and so I think that's special um, that, you know, if you have that mentality that you'll be able to continue to grow.
What's going on? Hi, everyone. Sorry, we're having a mini crisis. My daughter did not get picked up from school, so we're trying to figure it out with my husband. So, um, Catherine, do you want to go ahead real quick and I can chime in afterwards? Thanks. Totally. Yes, we got to take care of all those additional needs that we're all covering at this point in time, <laughs> day in the life for sure. Um, so I, again, I mentioned I enjoyed Christy's story because I really do think if you're if someone's interested in occupancy management, I'm always happy to have those conversations. Um, it, it doesn't seem to come up as often as I would like, uh, but I know that this this type of work isn't for everyone, and everybody's got good skill sets, and we want to help hone and nurture those. Um, and so anytime someone shows an interest or would like to know more about it, I am all over that. Like, let's set up time to talk. Um, you want to know what it's like to do this occupancy report? By all means, I'll show you how to do a pivot table. Oh, you want to know what it's like to do the census every month? Okay, let's, let, are you sure? <laughs> let's talk about how this works. Um, so yeah, I, I welcome those opportunities. And Again, I had people who um, helped shepherd me along the way when I was a young professional as well. And I really enjoy being able to pay it back. Um, we can't all be assistant directors of residence life, directors of residence life, deans of students. And so the more we can help people understand that there are a variety of different opportunities out there for them, I think the better our profession will be in the future. And also the more people will learn about where their skills and talents can help really be nurtured. Hi, I'm, I'm Novia Ramsey from uh, Hofstra University. And I just wanted to, just a, a comment that I think a, a lot of our resident assistants and even resident directors who get introduced to this field are not quite sure what it means to be on the operations end of it, right? They, yeah. they see that as the, we're always mean, we're the ones telling people about their bills and you know having to have them check to see who's in their rooms, et cetera. Um, but I think uh, as, as a group of, of individuals, women who are in this field, it's important for us to figure out a way with our directors of residence life um, to have them understand that if they intend to move on to become the director of residence life at their institution or elsewhere, they need to have a grasp on occupancy management because a lot of it has to do with projections, right? Uh, we, we bring in that extra money <laughs> mm -hmm. that the university depends on. And a lot of the time they don't see the correlation with the work we ask them to do on the programming and in terms of retention and how that could ultimately impact our ability to create new positions, right? An assistant director position that they could continue to grow within their own institution. So I think it's important for us to be able to uh, bridge that gap for them to understand uh, that for you to move forward in this field, you need to also, it may not be what you like to do, but you need to have a working understanding of what this portion of it is, especially if your school like mine, where I'm the director of uh, residential operations, but I'm housed in residence life. <laughs> yeah, that is so very true. Thank you. Michelle, I think you're back. Hopefully everything got taken care of. Resolved. <laughs> Thank you all for that. Um, I think the only thing that I would add, because I think that um, both Catherine and Christy shared a lot of the things I was going to share, was um, that you don't have to be an expert to make the shift. And I think that that is something that holds folks up, um, probably just women in general, uh, but holds folks up from moving or shifting within their career. And so if you have some of those transferable skills that we like to talk about in our field, um, th then you probably are uh, well on your way to making that that shift and um, thinking about being a strong administrator and some of your current work and how that can align with um, assignments and occupancy. And so I think that a lot of times, especially if you're a res life minded person, you get stuck in the programmatic piece and there's a lot of transferable piece that goes there, uh, goes along with that as well. Um, the only other piece I would add is, and it's only because the email came into my inbox right before this session started, was to look for some professional development opportunities. So I received the student housing business publication via email and hard copy, and it's not always directly relevant to the work that I do, but it is to nice to see what some industry standards are, um, some of those P3 organizations. So 
understanding that lingo through some of that free professional development work that you can do on your own time, um, learn a little bit, and then go to those folks that you can ask questions to and say, what does this mean? Um, I think has been really helpful to me and has been a, a tip that has been provided to me that I've found really helpful. Thank you. All right. Um, for our next question, what is one challenge and one triumph that you've experienced in your role? Um, for me, I would say my challenge and triumph are, are the same almost. Um, so I, for this role currently, my role was created um, in order, a big part of it was to, to transition the institution to online um, for housing assignments. Everything was done by paper. Um, and I will tell you, my supervisor still sometimes struggles when I say, we're not using that. We're not using that Excel sheet. Um, <laughs> she still gets a little frustrated with me and I'm like, well, and I was like, but she appreciates the challenge that I give her with that. Um, but not only was I tasked with transitioning the department to online for housing, um, I was also tasked with doing it while building it, while using it at the same time, um, which happens pretty often. Um, and and what I, from when I've talked to different people, um, I also had not used our housing assignment software of eResLife life before I was more aware with star res um, and they had already purchased e res life and so on and so forth. So I kind of had to learn it um, while building it, while using it all at the same time um, can say success. Um, and I can say that this past year um, we finished our returner process about three weeks ago. 97% um, of our eligible students selected housing um, through our like, our housing assignment process, which for them is like for this institution is probably the most successful housing assignment season we've ever had uh, because they were, you know, on paper before and this is in the midst of, of COVID and so on and so forth. Um, and so I, I sometimes look, says that, look at challenges like as an opportunity, um, you know, it's like, especially with um, housing assignments, we often talk about how they're like separate, right? We talk about how housing assignments is so separate from res life or operations, then you have res life. But I think they're so mingled. Um, I would not, you know, my team would have not been able to achieve a 97% without the RAs, without the staff, without all our partners engaged in the process. And so that's what I'm thankful for is that I look at it as a entire university and entire team, entire RA staff as a success for all of us. Um, not just, oh, the housing operations side, because everybody together, we're all here on the same team. Um, and I think sometimes because we kind of isolate ourselves in our own little bubble of housing assignments or housing occupancy, um, it gives our team the opportunity to learn too, right? As you all say, like, you know, I have an RA, our president sends out information um, every, like, every once a month we're on block scheduling. And he mentioned this is the most, like, to the whole university, the most successful housing assignment process we've ever had. And it was just like so exciting that the president wrote that in an email. And now, and then I had like, I mean, we have like all staff group me with all RAs and somebody like highlighted it and said, we did so good. And I'm like, we did do so good <laughs> as a team, not just like me over here scrambling with my little hands on my keyboard all the time. Um, and so I, I would say that is, you know, not only my challenge, but my triumph for me and my team. I would say um, one of my challenges is uh, at my institution, it's a very male heavy staff. And so um, I wasn't ready for, prepared for the sexism that I see in the work environment. Um, and not just that, it's just a different mindset that sometimes men take. And so um, that has been a challenge that I've had to work through finding some allies um, in, you know, I'm, I'm in a different department in housing, but I have a lot of the same work that I do with housing colleagues. And so trying to find the, the allies or uh, explain things differently. I work really closely with housekeeping and maintenance, which is not also in our department. And so um, again, a, a heavy male dominate, uh, uh, dominant is not the right word that I wanted to use there, but um, a heavy male influence in those um, departments as well. So so trying to navigate that as a woman has been really challenging for me. And um, one of the biggest successes in that challenge has been finding those allies and, and really finding my own voice in um, how to navigate some of those relationships. Um, a triumph, which is different than the challenge, is um, 
really finding some of the efficiencies in the work we do. And similar to what Christy was saying, uh, my role really took it from having mail package slips, right? Like we were still doing the mail package slips by the hundreds every day and getting those into an electronic system. And so we did that a lot with um, quite a few things. We moved um, into a star res uh, saw into Star Wars software from another company, um, which has been more efficient in a lot of the processes that we are doing, um, has opened up a lot of opportunities for our students to be able to be um, a little bit more self-managing in their assignment selection process, um, hoping to move that even further into the room change process in the future. So, um, so really hoping and continuing some of those efficiencies um, as we work through um, sort of the interdepartmental um, um, struggles that sometimes we have. You know, going being the the last one, my my challenge has now changed a couple of times just based on what I'm hearing from my colleagues here. And I wanted to touch just quickly on what Michelle was talking about with the sexism because I, uh, yeah, being the one woman in a room with a bunch of uh, tech guys and computer programmers, um, that has been challenging on, on many, many levels. And there's been many times where I've been the one woman in a room, um, and there have been times when people have blatantly just ignored me. Um, and so being the one to, to prove, hate ha having to do it, but proving that not only do I know what I'm talking about, but like I'm leading this conversation right now. Um, and so feeling the weight of that, both for just being the one woman in the room, but also representing other women and how this just looks, we, we can do this work as well and we can be really good and thrive at it. Um, but I'd say the, the biggest challenge that I've experienced in this role was this past year uh, with COVID and we're on the quarter system at Oregon State University. And so when things kind of closed down last March, we were ending our winter term and we had over 3,000 students move out within a couple of days. And it was essentially three of us managing that entire process uh, in terms of getting keys turned in and checking people out, moving them out um, and managing the billing that went with that. Um, and that was just so much going on. Uh, in addition to also figuring out personally how we were managing what was going on with the pandemic. Um, we were doing all of this work. We didn't, I think most of us could probably say we didn't really get any time off <laughs> during that entire period there. Um, a triumph that came from that though is uh, my team was able to help our department get multiple millions of dollars in CARES Act funding based on how we were able to prove the loss of revenue over that time period. And I was running reports, putting graphs together uh, for external auditors to prove just how much money we lost and the fact that that um, was able to be seen acknowledged and, and shown how accurate it was to those levels so high above that it helped our department get money in to keep people in jobs. Uh, and we were recognized by our VP of student affairs even for doing that. And it was a, um, it was, it was accolades that my team really needed because they had spent so much time working on all of this. And so they had been, they had worked so hard to make sure that the process for students just move out in that time last year was easy, as easy as possible. Um, and to see that kind of reward on the back end of, we helped save our colleagues' jobs in our own too, to be honest. But that was just really, um, that, that felt really good. Okay, uh, for our next question, who are the critical campus partners that enable you to do your job well? Um, but then additionally, how do you communicate your needs um, so that these campus partners can mindfully support you? Um, for me personally, I talk to admissions all day, every day, um, whether that's somebody's navigating an issue, um, whether that's just running reports and numbers. And um, sometimes they tend to, to explain fill more beds than I have. Um, and I'm just like, I, I can't do this. And we've had hotel conversations and things at times that we've had to navigate what that looks like. Um, so admissions, um, athletics compliance, we are always on the phone with talking to all the time, navigating occupancy, navigating full scholarships because we have a residency requirement here. So um, some students are in that, some people are not in that, what that looks like because the demand for beds is not 
is higher than what we have. Um, ADA specialists here on campus navigating um, who's approved, who's not approved. Um, sometimes there's more approved singles, private singles than we have and how do we navigate those conversations? Um, I feel like this year I'm already like questioning where I'm gonna find all these single beds that I'm supposed to have. Um, and that, and what people don't realize is that changes the overall bed count if I change rooms into different numbers and then that changes finances and it's just a never ending trickle effect that you have to kind of navigate and swirl through. Um, student financials, I sometimes feel like us and them are the two departments that tend to get um, yelled at a lot. Um, we, we bond over those moments, but also it, it's the people that we have to talk to the most. Um, I work with IT often. Um, I look forward to working with IT. We actually have a woman who is our person in IT and it's very exciting because we it's just nice to learn from each other. It's just a good feeling together in those meetings as two women kind of running assignments and occupancy. Um, and then we work with conduct. Um, I kind of mentioned I, I do a lot of conduct as a professional within my role. Um, but when students unfortunately get removed, and we had a lot of students removed this year because of conduct of COVID violations, um, making sure they're out, make, talking about, well, they're out of housing, but do they get to keep their meal plan and things like that and all those conversations. Um, we obviously work with others as well, but um, when it comes to those, those are the, like the ones I'd say I work with the most are them. Um, I would say one, I, I try not to only talk about work with mine when you talk about communicating, but I try to make a relationship like we're people. Um, and so I really try really hard to not just say in an email, hey, I need this, but more like, how's your day going? Like, what's going on in your life? Oh, you had a baby? That's fantastic. Tell, show me a picture. Um, I've sent a picture of my dog before in an email, and it's just because we're all going through different things. Um, and it's sometimes it's not, if you just focus on the work being done, you're not going to enjoy your job. So um, I send a lot of reports when it comes to communicating. We have an admissions liaison. Um, we have standing meetings with our ADA team. Um, as well as um, just making sure that all of the timelines add up. And I think those conversations really lead to success is when you have proactive conversations and then set up standing meetings as needed and so on and so forth. That's where we've been successful. Um, sometimes the ball gets dropped when there's a random situation and you always have to be prepared for those things. But when your peers and your colleagues know that they can call on you and in those situations, it's, that's a really powerful feeling. Can I say something really quick? Hi, my name is Melinda. Um, I am the residential um, facilities coordinator here at North Carolina A&T State University in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, what do you do when your situation, like you have a new executive director and things kind of topsy-turvy? You know, like there's the director wants to come in and just make all kind of changes and it affects your job and it affects, you know, the people that you used to work with For me and my position. Um, I started here in the IT department and they had a riff. I ended up coming over into housing. I do have my degree in business management. Um, I'm an alumni of the, of the university, so I was really OK coming back. I wanted to be able to give back to the university and I'm very big on customer service. Um, plus my daughter wanted to come here. So I felt like it was an amazing opportunity and amazing fit. Um, I also, um, I'm, like you said earlier, uh, Christy about, you know, like you want to just learn things and, you know, I'm, I'm that kind of person. I want to learn everybody's job, you know, not because I want to, you know, step on any toes or anything, but I just want to be able to really understand and help you better. So before this executive director that we have now, um, you know, I was like predominantly the per, like the go-to person. You know, everybody would come to me, you know, if they needed assistance with maintenance, if they needed assistance, um, you know, with the PA team, with, you know, furniture in the room or, you know, anything that involved the student room, you know, I would also help in the assignments office and different things. Um, I was even uh, affiliated with housekeeping. Well, housekeeping has been taken away. I'm no longer allowed to answer questions about assignments. All the hall staff were told, don't ask me questions, do your job. That's not Melinda's job, that's your job. So I not only do I feel like I've, I've lost the majority of my responsibility, um, I, I feel very limited. And, you know, like we've had new RAs that come in and, and I try to explain things to them and, and they're lost because there isn't really good training. Um, 
there are protocol systems that we've had in place and the, and the, um, the executive director has kind of put a halt to those, which blocks other people from being able to effectively do their jobs. So when you're in a structure where what you're accustomed to and what you've been doing for years is all of a sudden just halted, how do you cope? How do you, you know, keep coming to work and feeling like, okay, my purpose is what? I know that's a heavy question, but that's kind of where I'm at. Looking for some support. Thanks, Tina. Nobody? Anybody? <laughs> I guess, okay. I, I mean, Melinda, I've, I've actually, experienced um, a change with with the change in uh, a vice president of student affairs who came in with their own plans as to how they wanted to see the division to be perceived at the university. And I've actually encountered where we had a new dean of students whom after much conversation, it came to light that they were simply given instructions that this is what we've heard from past RA staff or RDs, this is what didn't work. And so my thing was to come in and just change it all. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, they don't always take the opportunity to speak to those who have been there the longest to gauge if the information that they've already been provided is actually accurate. Right. I can tell you that there were days that there were hard days because I know my worth and I know how hard I work. Right. Um, and, and I didn't think that I was getting the respect that I needed or deserved. But at some point, you will have to figure out what is most important to you and how you can still make it happen. With the change in, in my workload, eventually got shifted to new things. It just took a little bit longer for them to figure out, well, what new things do we want her to do um, based on this new structure? Uh, in the interim, I, I carved out a way to still have relationships with resident assistants or resident directors. They still knew that they had a safe space uh, that they could come into if they had questions. Um, and then I took the opportunity to find time to um, have coffee um, with individuals that may have direct contact with the vice president that I may not necessarily have. That could then be a buffer to try and get the information out about, you know, this is how staff may be feeling. Maybe they just need to communicate better with others what their intent is to make you feel better. But if you have a director that you're comfortable with, I would say you should be having those conversations about wanting to know with the change in structure, what does it really mean for you? What new things can you potentially take on so that you do feel that value that you, you felt before being more involved? And sometimes being less involved in some areas be becomes a blessing. It's just later down the line, you may see it as a blessing. <laughs> I understand and I appreciate that. Thank you so very much. Thank you for sharing that, Melinda. Um, to reiterate the original question for Catherine and Michelle, um, I had originally asked who are the critical campus partners that enable you to do your job well, um, but also how do you communicate your needs um, so that campus partners can support you as well. Thanks. Um, so I think Christy gave, gave an excellent list. Um, the one that I'm going to add to it is maintenance and housekeeping are some critical partners for us. Um, we, uh, you know, with room turn, I'm, I have hall closing on the mind, right? I don't know if anybody else does, but we're about to do spring to summer transition, which always feels like a nightmare, but ends up working out. So, um, but having those critical uh, open lines of communication are super important. Um, and having those relationships, I talk about, um, I bend over backwards all the time for housekeeping and maintenance for 10 months out of the year, because I know I'm gonna ask a lot of my colleagues in housekeeping and maintenance in probably April and August. So um, 
So I will bend over backwards for them to help out with them. And then I just try and be as proactive as possible. Sometimes that bites me Um, being proactive. I just end up reiterating what I was proactive about, but, um, but at least I've already done that uh, mental work, which is nice. And then um, what I've learned, I need to do a little bit more. And I think it's I do think it's because of COVID um, is communicating and being open to communicating when decisions are now out of my control. So things I used to be able to make decisions on are no longer things that I'm able to make decisions on. And so I communicate that so that they understand it's not me being difficult. It's being that we've now elevated where the decision makers are for some of these decisions. Yeah, I would agree that those are both really great lists. Um, I was trying to think of some additional uh, offices that I work with. Uh, we have marketing who are marketing staff who are internal to our department, and I work with them constantly, uh, making sure that we are communicating about, oh, we're getting a lot of questions at our front desk about X, Y, or Z, um, and they're awesome. They're like, great, we'll put a social media post up to help explain it or those kinds of things. Um, so they are great partners. I also talk to our general counsel a lot. Um, whether it's working through our contracts annually or some situation that's happened, but I find that I work with my general counsel more often than I ever have. I mean, there's a lot that plays into that. Even before COVID, um, I noticed that that was it was increasing quite a bit. And so to the point where she sees an email from me and she knows that it's going to be something very unique um, that will probably take a lot of her time to work through. So um, I consider that bonding. Um, and then I work pretty closely with our LLC partners. So we've got some academic partners who are very invested in some of our communities. Um, and that's something where I try to be uh, as transparent as possible with them and continue to um, be a good partner. Um, I also try and take the time that it needs to explain things when they just don't understand uh, something that's going on of, you know, why, why this, or why not that, or how does this process work? But I, I, I um, exercise more patience than I have as a person when working with those partners, because they, you know, ultimately our students in our communities that have academic partnerships do better. They get more connected to the university. Um, that matters. And so if it, if it means me taking 10 more minutes to explain how our process works to this academic partner so that they can then be a better partner to their students who are coming through their program, then it's worth that time. Uh, so I, I um, spend a lot of time with our academic partners. And then in terms of um, communicating needs, I think it's just that it's being communicative about why I need to be asking for something. Or if, if it's something, if I need to send something to general counsel and I need a quick turnaround, I'm very apologetic on it. Uh, but I'm also putting my deadline at the very top of the email because that's how they need to work. Um, and I had sent something to our general counsel a couple of weeks ago that I had needed pretty quickly, but I put my deadline at the bottom and she's like, I'm so sorry I missed that. <laughs> can you please put it bold at the top? And I was like, I can absolutely, if that helps you prioritize the millions of things that you're working on every day that I don't even want to know about, I can absolutely do that. And so I think it's it's really just being that open and transparent. And if something is a quick turnaround, apologizing, but also being willing to be that quick turnaround for other colleagues as well. Because understanding that we're just, we're, we're already dealing with a lot a year and a half ago and then COVID really threw things up in the air and they all just kind of landed where they did. And so there's there's a layer of pressure and stress that didn't exist in the same way before. And I think that we're all just trying to figure out how do we maintain, how do we survive, and then how are we good to each other in that. Okay, um, I know we're getting near the end of our time. Um, so for the last few minutes, if y'all just want to openly share um, what you do or enjoy doing to help you stay dialed in, kind of work-life balance and things like that. Um, and while they're answering that, if anyone has any last minute questions um, or any comments they want to um, put out there, feel free to drop those in the chat and we'll go from there. I love this question because in my first couple of roles, I didn't have any work-life balance, but I can tell you, I definitely have more work-life balance now. And I feel like it's something I work on every single day. Um, I personally go to the gym every day, I wake up at 5.45 AM and I go kickbox. Um, sometimes I think about certain people or certain situations and I punch the bag. Sometimes I don't. 
Um, but it's something that gets me up pumped for the day, gets my energy at a good place. I can tell when I, if I don't, I'm in a really rough mood um, and no one else needs that. Um, and so I go to the gym every single day. I also have a dog. Um, I know pets are not for everyone. He does control my life, but um, knowing that I get to go to home to him um, and knowing, you know, that he's there is a good feeling. Um, I will also say like, I plan vacations. It, it dry, me and my boss have this conversation all the time because she's not a planner. Um, I intentionally plan and I'm always like, I'm planning because then I can work around our, our busy seasons. I was like, I know you, you're getting stressed about duty, but look, I'm telling you, I know when housing assignments are coming out, I will be in for that. I just won't be in the week after that. <laughs> um, you know, and I, I plan those things intentionally, um, even though it drives her crazy. And I always tell her, I'm like, so I have the next, my next subject is your favorite topic. It's vacation time. Um, but I'm intentional because I, I deserve that, you know, and I, and I believe in that. Um, and so, and I also think the other part of how I enjoy my job is I make relationships, like I said, whether it's with my students, whether it's with these parents that become best friends with me because they call me every other five seconds about what's going on in their life. Um, I just try to make it less about the business all the time and just say like, how's it going? Oh, like I have this one student, I've never really talked to her daughter, but her mom calls me and she's like, I've known about her mom this whole time, about all the things going on with this lady's, this parent's mom. And I'm always like, so how's your mom doing? Um, because I at least try to make it a little, you know, I try to like my job. And I think that's something that sometimes takes work. I don't think people realize you, you have to put the work in sometimes to actually enjoy what you do because some of those hard times are rough. Um, and I really try to do that um, and go from there. I don't even know what the future holds for me, whether in higher ed or not in higher ed or occupancy or what that looks like. Um, but if I can enjoy the present moment, that's something I, I really strive to do every single day. This one's always a tough one for me, and it's not because I don't have things I enjoy outside of work because I have learned that this is a J-O-B, right? It, it, it pays the bills and it's something I enjoy doing, but it's still a job. Um, but I change, like I just ebb and flow with what gives me new energy. So, um, so it's baseball season. So thank God it's baseball season because now I can cheer for my Cardinals. Sorry, Sierra. Uh, I am not a Reds fan. I, I go to Cardinals games in Cincinnati. Um, but, um, so, so that brings me a lot of energy is, is, uh, sports and, and the camaraderie with baseball season and, and sports. Um, right now we are, reading a lot in my house. I have a kindergartner. She's finishing up kindergarten. She's learning the love of reading. She reads everything she understands and then some. Um, my husband, who's not really a reader, is now reading. He set a goal for himself to read 12 books this year. And I was like, wow, that's a big goal for you. I mean, that's a big goal for me, but like, that's a big goal for him who's not a reader. So he's um, been reading the Harry Potter series and I was on book two when he started. So now I have to keep ahead of him. So like I'm aggressively reading through the Harry Potter series as well. Um, I have found, I don't love to work out. In fact, I despise working out, but I know it's good for me. So I try and do it anyways, but I have found a new love for, um, 15 minutes in the morning, I'll do 10 minutes of yoga and five minutes of meditation through a couple different apps and, um, and, shocked at how great I feel in the morning and how great I don't feel when I don't do it. So I've um, been trying to do that um, in the mornings and just kind of, and and I, and if you would have told the pre COVID Michelle, that that would have been a thing, I would have been like, you're silly. I probably would have said a different word, but, but in, we're in a professional city setting. So you're silly um, because that stuff doesn't work for me, but it really worked for works for me in my current state. Um, and then a newfound, and I'm just going to do a shameless plug here because I can, I guess, um, is I started a podcast and I went out on a whim, said, I'm going to do this thing. And I did this thing and, um, I'm loving it and don't have a ton of listeners, but I didn't expect to be Rachel Hollis out the gate. Um, so, um, so it's been, it's been a lot of fun for me and uh, something new and different. Uh, yeah, I'll put it, I'll put it in the, in the chat here. It's called the I'm done apologizing podcast. You can find it on every, uh, anywhere you find a podcast. So it's kind of fun. Okay, definitely looking up your podcast. 
Um, well, it's funny what I what I do for self care. Well, I picked up and moved across the country over the summer and got married. So um, I mean that was already in the works pre COVID, but it still happened. Uh, so now I went from being kind of on my own to being a wife, a stepmother, a dog mom. I kind of checked off a lot of different boxes. So um, can't help but have forced. Uh, um, boundaries with work in that regard. Uh, my, my priorities shifted pretty dramatically, um, but I've also been working out every day, every morning, um, kind of like Christy. I kind of alternate between um, using this treadmill that's behind me, um, which I've started running again, which I hadn't done in like five years, uh, and then strength training on my alternate days. And um, I am a person of routine and pattern. And so if I, um, if I'm, can come up with a pattern that works for me and a routine that works for me, then I can stick with it. And so uh, I'm lifting weights heavier than I ever have, um, going longer distances. And yeah, I truly feel better uh, in the morning if I've gotten 30 or 40 minutes of working out in. And if you had asked me a year ago, I would have laughed. Like that's not who I, I don't, mornings need to just be over with. That's that's how I feel about them. So uh, it's amazing how, how much you can change as a person in, in a year. Okay. It was great to hear about everyone's self-care routines and how they're different from one another. Um, but on behalf of Akuhuai Women in Housing Committee, I do want to say thank you to all of our panelists for answering all these great questions. I know I learned a lot more about occupancy management and such, so that was exciting. Um, and thank you for everyone that attended. I hope um, you got a lot out of this and enjoyed our time. Um, but I'm going to pass it back over to Paige. Um, I believe she has a few more things she wanted to mention, and then we'll wrap it up. Paige, you're muted. <laughs> there we go. That happens every time. Uh, sorry, Spencer. Um, so... The last thing we have for you, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. The panelists today, thank you so much. You dropped a lot of gems um, and just for the rich conversation as well. Just wanted to highlight the network uh, leadership. And so Melinda, Deanna, and Star is also in this space. So if you ever need anything, you can also email them as well. Um, and then thank you for joining us. And we appreciate you spending time and join us in May for our next roundtable.